to glide, to pass along by smooth, continuous movement without effort or difficulty, to go unperceived, quietly or stealthily, to pass gently or imperceptibly, to fly without motor power. Wakery, South Australia. To this hot and barren corner of the earth, 67 of the world's finest glider pilots have journeyed from 22 countries to decide who shall have the title, champion of the world. On the ground, everyone is tense and is chasing for seconds, for money or whatever. And then we have a wonderful chance to go up in the air and uh, get away from all this nonsense. And what we do is we import just this nonsense from the ground into the air. But uh, we can't help it. We are human. in history, the skies of the Southern Hemisphere will be the arena for a world championship. With their sailplanes and their crews, with their plans and hopes, the pilots have travelled half the world to do battle. Students, teachers, chocolate makers, dentists and plastic surgeons. In style and temperament there are no two alike, but in two things there is one. They want to fly and they want to do it better than anyone else in the world. The style I use is basically a very forceful driving style anyway. I go pretty fast and I don't fool around. I fly the best if I forget about competitions and just fly in a leisurely and normal way. Thomas Belts, college student from Miami, Florida. At 22 years of age, Belts is the youngest competitor at Wakery. To Belts, competitive gliding is a special kind of gamble. Good luck, he doesn't need it. Bad luck, he doesn't want to know about it. If you're riding a bicycle and Joe beside you is riding a bicycle, you want to see if you can beat Joe down the next block. So you say, Joe, do you want to race? If Joe doesn't want to race, you say, well, that means I could beat you anyway, so there's no competition. Adele Orsi is the open class champion of Italy and the only female competitor at Wakery. It's not very important to win. They just like gliding and gliding with friends. Frenchman Francois Regal. In competition, I fly for fun. It's a fun to fly in competition. It's not necessary to win. Well, basically, the only reason I'm here is to win. As contest day one approaches, nerves become tense, leading to small errors in judgment. And so the questions mount. Am I ready? Who do I need to watch? Who's watching me? How hard should I push? How can I play it cool when I've just landed with my damn wheel up? There are two classes of sailplane competing at Wakery. The standard class, which is designed to a specific racing formula, and the open class, which allows performance boosting modifications. The rules are quite simple. Take off from point A, fly to points B and C, photograph them with the cockpit camera to prove that you've been there, and return to point A. Do all of this as quickly as possible. Each day a different task is set. For the fastest man, 1,000 points. For the others, a percentage of that 1,000, depending on their relative time. For those who don't complete the course, just some points for the distance they have traveled. It's a bit like a mixture of a car rally and a yacht race. The rules, quite simple. The strategy, more like a game of chess than a race. You can make as many starts as you want. Your timing is taken from the last one you make. You can even make more than one circuit of the course, provided you think you have the daylight hours necessary. Your best time is the one you register with the judges. The contest can last anywhere from four to 14 days, depending largely on the weather. The name of the game is consistency. One good day can't win it. One bad day can lose it. Okay, 
The start line, one square kilometre of airspace. One very closely watched square kilometre. If you go through too high, too low or too wide, you'll be told to go back and start again. From the time you hear good start, your race is on. In planning rooms and radio rooms, in computer rooms and dark rooms, the watchdogs are at work. It took a lot of talking to get the World Championships to Australia. Talking that was mainly about the weather, because it's the rising currents of warm air that a pilot must search out. The rising air that allows birds to climb without a flap of their wings. The rising air called thermals. Statistically, the hot and dry conditions in South Australia should provide better thermals than most countries. Statistically, it should make for a great competition. January 12th. Officially, the first day of competition. Ironically, the first day of rain. No task is set. The following day, no change. Wakery weather is not what it should be. West German Hans Werner Grosser holds the world long distance gliding record. To Grosser, physical fitness is essential to competitive gliding. I do a lot of skiing and I do long distance uh, runs and I. Uh, have quite a good time in a hundred meters. You know, I don't go out and run every day for riding. I wouldn't want to go out and run ten miles an hour, or two miles, or one mile. Well, physical fitness is certainly important. Riding just plain is not a physical thing. Well, I think that physical fitness is very important in a competition like this. It'll last for about 14 days. You don't get points for going to bed early. People will get very tired. <laughs> you know, you don't get points for staying sober or anything. You get points for when you start flying your race. So you end. I do everything kind of by feel, by way it looks. In other words, once I get within 15 miles, or once I get within eye view of the airport, I eyeball it the rest of the way. I do it by feel, by the way it looks. I eyeball it. Maybe because it visually, he's very clever. He accepts the fact that he's got a lot to learn, but he's also got that uh, cockiness of youth, which gives you that extra burst of energy and that extra enthusiasm. After four years of planning, the administrators are anxious to get their first world championship underway. Despite the fact there is very little improvement in the weather, on January 14, they set their first task. 67 gliders are launched, and 67 gliders fail to complete the course and have to be retrieved. Weary crews will spend the night spread over the countryside, retrieving their pilots, taking the glider apart, putting it in the trailer, and bringing it home. Then there'll be time for 20 minutes sleep. It's really quite a lot of fun, provided you love it. By morning, the usually orderly tie-down area looks more like a battlefield. When the scores are posted, contest day one belongs to the French. Pernod and Mercier are first and second in the standard class. Cartry and Rago are first and second in the open class. A disastrous first day for Wakery is a great day for France. George Moffat from the USA. World champion in 1970, the 46-year-old New Jersey school teacher is highly favored to win again. When thermals are very strong, the heavier your aircraft, the faster you fly. To be able to adjust their weight to the varying weather conditions, sailplanes carry water ballast. To conform to aircraft regulations, the designers must register the maximum weight of ballast for which their aircraft has been safety tested. The open class favorite makes no secret of the fact that he is increasing his plane's capacity to carry extra ballast. In so doing, he opens more than his wings. In the past, as long as I've been flying, there's always been a rule saying you had to fly within the uh, certified gross weight of the aircraft. 
but in actual practice, no one's ever paid the slightest attention. Any glider flying here should be operating within the airworthiness requirements of a contracting country. Now here, some team manager took it upon himself to call up the government and say that this was uh, being done and it was dreadful and the government ought to intervene. So the contest committee, um, Wally Wallington, has been put in a terrible position of trying to inf enforce an essentially unenforceable rule. Wally and I are placed in no more difficult position in this one than the director and deputy director of every one have faced. Uh, they intend at the present moment to weigh two aircraft a day ostensibly chosen by lot. The, the organization, the director has said it will be random. Everybody knows quite well who has the capability for the maximum weight. Pilots who can anticipate the, uh, the conditions that are going to exist in the country where they'll be competing, they have a distinct competitive advantage. I know that some people are flying with lead, 70 kilos has been mentioned in one case, and uh, of course they endanger themselves. There is no safety problem at all. Klaus Holighaus from West Germany is designer of George Moffat's Nimbus and designer of 25 other aircraft flying at Wakery. The designer, after all, he's in the business to sell gliders. Uh, if you carry more water, uh, I think the glider is even more safe. It might very bloody well not be safe. He might have just picked the bloody right upper limit for the thing. These fiberglass gliders are uh, so strong, it's, it's impossible to break it during flight. This whole business of gross weight for aircraft is going to be a, a something that really hurts the championships a lot here. We may not weigh the aircraft, there are all sorts of issues. The last word I heard was they're going to weigh them. Contest day three, the first booming day. Lift conditions are strong and you need all the weight you can get. With that weight, pilots will be able to push their aircraft faster between the thermals, thus picking up valuable seconds. The one thought uppermost in all pilots' minds is, whose aircraft will the marshals weigh this morning? But there are no scales on the launching pad. I know I'm legal, but I'm not so sure about some other people. <laughs> in the standard class, Frenchman Mercier wins his second day in a row. In the open class, George Moffat wins for the first time and moves into second place overall. Quite clearly, he's going to be the man to watch. Contest day five. Moffat wins again and takes the lead in the open class from Grosser and Rago. In the standard class, Frenchman Mercier still leads from New Zealander Gordon and Englishman Fitchett. Michael Kuhn of Mexico is the only pilot who has not yet made it back. For each man in the air, a crew of three on the ground. A very hard working crew whose job it is to keep their pilot where they would dearly love to be themselves in the air and competing. I'd give a lot for a damn female 11th connector right now. Why do we need to However, the degree to which a ground crew contributes to the result is a matter of opinion. And opinions, like the pilots who have them, are not always alike. The fundamental aspect of the sport is that it is an individual sport. No, it's not. It's a, it's a team effort. Soaring competition is really a one-man thing. It is a team effort, definitely. I, I, would, I would say it's basically a one-man game. It is a team effort. No, it's almost totally individual. No, that's not right. That's, I don't agree with that. Um, without your crew, you haven't got a pilot. You, you haven't got an aircraft. It's a real team effort. Uh, I rely on my uh, crews very much. In the standard class, Ingo Renner, the 33-year-old German-born Australian, is the hope of the local crowd. Yeah, how do you feel? All right. Thank you. Good. Oh, not really, but <laughs> try my best. I remember my first solo flight. The instructor told me I could go solo, and I was really happy that it was the last flight in the day because the sun was set already. And I, they launched me up to something like 400 meters, and I was all on my own. I saw the uh, lights of the villages go on, and 
the you know, cars on the highways, they had all the headlights on, and the stars started to, to shine, the moon was shining. It was beautiful. And I, I never forget that flight when I was all my, on my own for the first time. But many competitors fear the Australian's knowledge of local conditions, the lack of cloud, the lack of landmarks, the lack of almost anything. We normally have cumulus to mark the thermals. If it's blue, like it is here most days, we don't have very good conditions at all. In Italy, I always fly in mountains, and it's a completely different way of flying from a flat country. Well, I consider any familiarity with an area must be an advantage, and all the pilots flying in our team are from reasonably familiar to very familiar with the area. We get these sort of conditions sometimes in the UK, but... Uh... It is more difficult when there are no clouds to show you where the thermals are. You just have to press on and hope you hit a thermal. The mere fact of not having to pick up a map and look at it must be some advantage. Uh, the statistics of the previous World Championships show that uh, local knowledge doesn't uh, bear uh, much weight. Contest day six. The open class flies the longest task ever set for international competition, a triangle of 707 kilometers. Only 10 of the 28 open class pilots make it home. And the first man back, Francois Rago. Uh, usually in my club, I take off very early and uh, I land only at the end of the day. So I used to fly a very long time. But right behind him in the open class, the consistent George Moffat. Second for the day, but still leader overall. In the standard class, Ingo Renner finishes a mere one-tenth of one kilometre per hour behind Tunis of Holland and moves up to fourth place. You have to be patient and sit back and wait until your opponent makes a mistake, like in chess, and take advantage of it. One man in particular is waiting for just that mistake, from Renner. He is Helmut Reichmann. 32-year-old university lecturer from West Germany. Four years ago, with an unprecedented low of only 300 gliding hours behind him, he won the World Standard Class Championship in Texas. Along with Australian Renner, he shares the favoritism for the Standard Class again. Despite his slow start in the competition, he's by no means to be discounted, for he knows full well that consistency is the name of the game. The enjoyment is a big part of set gliding too because uh, if one enjoys flying also in a championship one is freer in one's decisions and being free in the decisions uh, normally uh, makes uh, decisions clearer, better and more accurate. Mrs. Hildy Reichmann. In the morning I'm a teacher and in the afternoon I'm a mother because I've got two children, and in the evening I'm wife, and on weekends I'm a group man member. <laughs> if one's wife is a good wife, it is about the best team member that can be expected, because it's easier for her to understand her husband's mental position. Helmut, here is there. 180 Grad 25 Knoten. Nehmen wir Sierra von Wagen. Links von dir kurbeln einige Maschinen. Links vor mir jetzt oder vor Ihnen? Jetzt vor dir. Ist doch das, ne? Ja, das stimmt. Mhm. Du fliegst vielleicht genau drauf zu, kannst du geradeaus. Okay, ich hab den Sicht. Das ist der Sport. Uh for the brain, like squash. It's not uh, for only for the body, it's also something for the uh, brain. And uh, so when you are in the crew and you know him very well, you can help him. Contest day seven. In the open class, Moffat wins again, 
and opens up a formidable lead of over 350 points. Rago outlands and drops from the top three for the first time. The question now remains. Can the Frenchman fly well enough over the remaining days of the competition to fight his way back to be amongst the leaders? West German Grosser struggles with the very weak conditions, makes it back at last light to gain not only the admiration of the crowd, but also enough points to hold on to second place. In the standard class, Mercier can manage only 19th, but his early performances keep him in first place overall. He's now been in the lead for six days straight. Ingo Renner makes third for the day, and he's now in the top three. With the contest two-thirds over, Helmut Reichmann is conspicuous by his absence from the top three. He's been lying fourth or fifth for the last five days, but the consistency of the leaders is keeping him at bay. The best thing to get into a world championship is not to be regarded as one who may be first afterwards. The fact that I realize that I'm supposed to do well in the contest uh, has very little uh, psychological effect. Current open class title holder, you're an axe of Sweden. I don't think it has any effect, really. But Reichmann, Moffat and Axe are not the only world champions at Wakery. Jan Robleski of Poland is here, too. Current standard class champion of the world and the former open class champion, he's the holder of gliding's most cherished honour, the Lilienthal Award. But Jan Robleski is not competing. I have finished competitive flying, thinking that what I have achieved is everything that can be achieved. It's hard for someone to choose the moment of ending what you may call a sporting career. I consider it's better to step down from the pinnacle undefeated rather than later get humiliated in defeat. Competition flying is very expensive, even in a communist country where he comes from. Uh, having to fly 700 hours a year to stay current, like they do over there, that means that in this 700 hours he can't earn money. He has a young family now and uh, wants to look after. It's his own private decision to look after his family. Ted Rainiak is the manager of the Polish team. As I have said before, it doesn't take a lot of time to synchronize their flying. I've actually devoted half of my life, although I'm not very old, to gliding. I started when I was very young, barely 15 years of age. It was part of my life, and actually still is, simply being, spending all the time in the air. I feel it is my place. It feels beautiful up there. Well, that's an oversimplification, really, like a bird in the air, a fish in water. Cooperation, individualists, family pressures, government directives, and one-man goals. The Polish champion is not saying, but it's obvious. His heart is in the blue skies over Wakery. Whatever the real reasons, Jan Rablewski flies aerobatics for the crowd, whilst 39 of the world's best pilots are fighting for his title, a title he will not or cannot defend. Our pilots start in championships, primarily for their pleasure as pilots. But I am deeply convinced that one of the greater pleasures is the possibility of representing the country. But separating the individual from the country is a question that goes beyond Jan Rablewski. There are no prizes for countries, only for the individual. Nationalism has as much importance as the individual or his manager chooses to give it. You know, I'm happy to represent the United States, and that's, you know, whatever I can do, I can do, but it's also what I can do for myself. Well, I'm representing the UK, yes, I'm, I'm flying for the UK. I'd be flying for your next, just myself. I would be very glad only to compete, and winning would have no importance for me, but being in the Italian team, I should try to do my best. The West German glider pilots think to me being here, they are sure that I will uh, fight for, for my country. Oh, I don't think at all. I, I fly. Well, uh, I'm just flying to beat all the others, including the other Germans. And uh, all this uh, nationalism and all this national feeling uh, that we had 
uh, in an excessive way, 30 years, uh, years ago, uh, are over for us once and forever. 9,000 miles from the workaday world of a New Jersey private school classroom, a pretty young American finds a moment to relax. Someone had said before, oh, George Moffin and Suzanne Bundy should meet because there'll be fireworks one way or the other, and there were. Suzanne Moffat is both wife and crew member to the American open class favorite. It just, uh, it's like I've known him always, and I always want to be with him in however many laws I may have. It just works. I can't explain it. This doesn't always work. Doug Gaines, a competitive pilot in his own right, is also on the crew. Of course, of course in her case it does, because they're a very close-knit couple. They have no children. It's just the two of them. Uh, and uh, they very much live for each other. We spent, what, 10 years together, I guess? And uh, we've never spent a night apart or a day apart, we, a whole day. And we wouldn't want to. Well, of course, she's a wife, and there are good wives and there are bad wives, uh, as far as soaring goes. Now, she generally does a pretty good job of looking after him and patting him on the ass or whatever it takes, you know. But she gets in the way, too, sometimes. You know, my wife and Suzanne are quite different. I still notice they do the same things. They talk about things that are unnecessary to talk about. George has never, in a single moment, ever bored me or irritated me. And he claims the same thing. So, and I think that it's true. Uh, how to say it? Okay, a bunch of fellas, a bunch of men get together. You've got a nasty job to do. You kind of pitch in, and maybe everybody's in a semi-shitty mood, you know. But you go ahead and do the job, and maybe you kid each other a little bit. But there are certain circumstances when, if there are two or three women around, for instance, to fuss over you, it wasn't the time when you wanted them around, you know, like the extra fussing around actually slowed you down. I've always been more of a boy than a girl anyway, so it doesn't matter. You know, they accept me as one of the boys. He wouldn't go without her. The only thing practical I do is that if I didn't come, he wouldn't come. So if I weren't here, he wouldn't be here. <laughs> I suppose that's all I do, really. I think if you can have a wife who is really interested as crew, that's absolutely the best crew there is. Contest day eight. In the standard class, Reichman comes into the picture with his first win. And although still fourth overall, he's closing the gap. Day belongs to Brenner. He finishes just seven points behind Reichman and on aggregate takes the lead in the standard class. It's the first time in history that an Australian has ever been in the lead in a world championship. In the open class, defending champion Axe of Sweden comes into the picture with his first win. But the top three doesn't change. Consistency is proving a winner for Grosser, Ziegels of Belgium and above all, Moffat. During the contest, the pilots prepare themselves mentally or psych themselves to varying degrees. George psychs himself up. I think all of the pilots do. They all do it in different ways. The, um, uh, some do it by kicking holes in airplanes. George says he doesn't worry about psyching himself up. This is what he'll tell you. For me, it's absolutely automatic. I'm, show me a starting line, I'm psyched up. I think he does it in a low-key kind of way, but he doesn't try this psych up thing. Some of them do. I think Hans Werner does. No, I never do that. I don't uh, believe in what some people uh, call psyching, psyching yourself up to be a winner. I, I think that's really rubbish. Yes, you've got to get yourself into a, a, an equable state of mind, certainly. Oh, the problem is not to pr prepare myself, but the problem is to prepare the, the gliders. My problem is just to calm down. People do tend to get very much on edge. They tend to be a little bit edgy with each other and things they do and say. 67 gliders at Wakery, and 66 of them are white. The Finnish standard class entrant, FN, or Foxtrot November, is not only distinguished by its defiance of the color uniform, it is the first competitive design to take advantage of a loophole in the standard class regulations and incorporates wing flaps. According to some, this should increase performance by up to 20%. According to some, this will set the precedent for future standard class design. According to others, the young Finn at the controls lacks the sophistication of his sailplane and should be better placed in the competition. In any event, the bright yellow craft attracts the attention of the crowd and the scrutiny of the engineers. 
Aircraft number one and Tango Bravo, please come to the flight office for outlanding reports. Tango Bravo. Tom Belts finds out what it's like to view a wheat field from ground level. If you blow one day or you get very unlucky, you know, you'll drop right out of the top ten. And that's very fast. And if you have another bad day, pressing, trying to get back in the top ten, you know, it's the way the game's played. You know yourself that you're as good as, say, most people in the top ten, but if you're not there, you know, what the hell. So, like, right now I'm probably 18th. Land out. Two of the most unpopular words to a competitive pilot. When there's no air rising, no matter where you look, there's only one way to go, and that's down. Probably in a wheat field. And if you're good at it, by a farmhouse. the meaning of the phrase one bad day can lose it becomes a reality. It's the luck of the game. And as his sailplane is towed back to the airfield, the scoreboard tells its own story. Well, you know, I can't worry about it. It's, I got too many other things to think about, you know. This is just one of them, actually. I did the best I could, that's the way it is. Contest day nine. In the open class, Euron Axe wins his second day in a row, and he's now only two points from the top three. But the consistency of Moffat continues. He finishes third for the day and increases his lead overall to almost 450 points. It seems he only has to stay in the air to stay in front. Axe, Cartree, and Moffat all break the world speed record for 500 kilometers, but the task is not an official triangle and the record books will not be changed. In the standard class, Reichman finishes second for the day and moves yet closer. He is now just 17 points from the top three, but still 170 points behind Renner, who finishes fourth for the day and retains his lead overall. Michael Kuhn of Mexico, our plans again. On the ground, amidst the dust and the heat, the crews toil on, pushing harder and harder. I'm melting. <laughs> Contest day 10. For the first time, a world championship has gone more than nine days, and there is still the chance for another. Wakery weather has lived up to expectations, and the effects on the pilots are telling.
the day there is no Frenchman to be found in the top three in either class. Open class champion Axe has made his way into the top three and still has a chance to retain his crown. The world record distance holder Grosser can only manage 15th place for the day and slips from the top three for the first time. The slow starting but persistent Reichman takes advantage of the strain on the leaders in the standard class and wins well to move to second place overall. The exceptional length of the contest means that he has not yet lost. Standard class leader Ingo Renner has been poised for victory for three days and now the host country must wait yet another day for their first ever world champion. Only the incredibly consistent Moffat goes ruthlessly about the task of increasing his lead in the open class. He has now finished in the top three on eight of the ten contest days and leads by more than 450 points. Contest day 11, the day of decision. At 9.30 the task is set. For the leaders, a realisation that they must fly well again. One bad decision, or even bad luck, could cost them the title, despite the fact that they've already won over a greater number of competition days than has ever been required in the past. For those who are pressing the leaders, the realisation that there is still hope. Moffat, Grosser, Ziegels, Axe, Renner, Reichman, Kempke, Fitchett. The wind is strong. It's not a good soaring day. The tasks are short, and so are nerves. Ingo Renner's crew chief, Joe Lacey. Oh, our stomach's in the mouth, and I can't seem to quite get back there. I've been to the doctor and had some tablets to try and settle me down a bit, but uh, I think we'll be on pins and needles for the rest of the day. Yeah, of course I'm confident. At the same time, I'm holding my breath, so <laughs> don't ask me until the end of the day. For Reichman, the last chance, a very slim chance. Only 247 kilometres to fly, and more than 100 points to make up. For the young German, there's nothing to lose and everything to gain. Can he bridge the gap and make world champion for the second time? Uh, no, I don't think this really, because the difference of points is too large. There's 120 points, and that should be by accident if I would have a chance to win. For Renner, there's a great deal to lose. Surrounded, encouraged, loved, photographed. In a matter of hours, he can be champion of the world. There's still a task to fly that Renner is not about to throw away Australia's first chance to have a world champion. Moffat. By now his competitors wonder if he's man or machine. But with just 294 kilometres between him and the world championship, the answer is obvious. This is a very human machine. And humans can make mistakes. Axe. He needs that mistake. And he needs it today. If he doesn't get it, he is that same 294 kilometres away from being the X open class champion of the world. Kuhn, the man with the least to lose, but possibly the most to gain. He could still find out what it's like to fly in to Wakery Airport. Yes, yeah, so I hope that will be a good thing, so I hope I'll make it back. Huh? I haven't made it back yet, but it's always the first time. For the 11th day, the world's best pilots are towed into the sky, and it seems there is nothing left now but to wait. But that assumption is the first wrong thing about contest day 11. Within minutes of being launched, Zulu Romeo is on approach to touch down in the relight area. Ingo Renner is coming down. His dive brakes have developed a malfunction. With the aid of the Australian comes not only his own crew, but also that of Helmut Reichmann, who is past the start gate and on the way. The mechanical problem is fixed as well as possible in the time, but the Australian gets back into the cockpit with a warning. Don't exceed 100 kilometres per hour or the pressure may force the dive brakes up again. Renner is relaunched, but now he has even a greater pressure to contend with. Uncertainty. Where's Reichmann? What speed is he making? 
Is it possible that Reichman could pick up enough points? Will the dive brakes remain in place? What speed is necessary to ensure enough points? Why did it happen today? Why today? Reichman has gone through the start gate at 1.39 and is well on the way to the first turn point. Renner starts at 1.54, which means he must land within 15 minutes of Reichman to equal his time. Every minute beyond that means a gain in points to the West German, and he needs 109. As Renner moves out chasing the main group, those on the ground sense the possibility of a close finish between he and Reichman. It was pretty important to get the, the job done as quickly as possible, and we were just fortunate that the German uh, team had, had one member that knows the Cirrus inside out, works for, for Klaus Hollinghaus. At 10 past four, Reichmann's prototype LS2 lands, averaging 106.2 kilometers per hour. It's good, but is it good enough? How far behind is Renner? There's still time for a second run if he wants, and there's nothing to lose. Even if he lands out, he's trying as fast as possible. Even if he is very low. Yeah. <laughs> Still got time. Yeah, the chance. Uh, I mean, no guarantee, but much time. Reichmann decides to try it. At 4.19, he's back in the air. Now the waiting game starts again. The wait for Renner's Zulu Romeo. The wait for the first Australian world champion. At 4.42, the waiting ends. Renner is back. His average speed, 95.6 kilometers per hour. It appears at this stage as though Ingo Renner still maintains his lead. With Helmut Reichmann from West Germany in second position. Looks like you might have it with about 30 points to spare, Ingo. Reichmann's gone again. Would you like to go? No. You don't want it? I don't think so. Oh, no. I'd like you to try it. His crew chief says go again. Congratulations, Ingo. His team manager says congratulations to the new champion. Would you like to have a go? The world champion can have a go. Good on you. What about water? Want more water? For the shy Australian, it's a moment of confusion. It seems there's no way he can lose, and despite his crew chief's anxiety, he decides there is no time for a second run. Yeah, Reichman done it in 220. Yeah. Yeah. I did it at three hours, see? Yeah. Yeah, that's hard. Congratulations. Ingo Renner is not the only standard class pilot who is happy to be home. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. There's something from us for you. Oh, thank you very much. I think we, we shall put it in the okay. ice box and bring it back now. Some people told me I have a keg of, keg of beer waiting for me over there, you know? So I better go over and drink it. At the other end of the field, an open class Nimbus makes a regulation approach. A regulation touchdown, and another day's work is ended. While the standard class championship hangs in the balance, George Moffat calmly rolls to a stop into his second World Open Class Championship. For Moffat, a fitting conclusion to 11 days of precision flying. For his crew, the exhilaration of their second World Championship in four years. He's glad he beat somebody. Reichman, in the meantime, is battling against deteriorating weather conditions. The only thing he's sure of is that he must try to make a better time than his first run. But the further he goes, the more obvious it becomes that his second attempt will be slower. Fifteen minutes before the West German lands, the unofficial result is announced to the spectators. It's not communicated to Reichman in flight. As he lands, he only knows that he has failed to beat his previous time. What he does not know is that in the complex computerized scoring system, 
His first time, relative to the fastest recorded for the day, has made him world champion by 29 points. Now he knows. Overlooked in the earlier excitement was the fact that Kemker of Poland recorded the fastest time for the day. The relative times of Reichmann and Renner gave Reichmann his second world championship by the smallest of margins. If you can imagine the feeling that you get when you stand on the top of a high cliff and you see birds soaring up and down, you sort of feel, wouldn't it be nice if I could just leap off this cliff and drift gently down? Um, it's the feeling of wanting to get airborne. I've felt like that since I was about 12 years old. If you just want to fly the damn thing around the sky, that's one thing, but if you want to race it, a glider is quite an interesting item. We can more or less see it ourselves as uh, explorers who uh, try to rub away the white spots on the map. It's the competitive spirit and it's the friendly get-together spirit when one's landed and is in the bar afterwards. Gliding is like being in love because when you leave the ground it has that same kind of breathless feeling of, you know, joy, freedom kind of thing. It's a certain feeling of freeness. Uh, especially if you fly over a very crowded street with a lot of cars. He's not enjoying it. There's no way he's enjoying it. Because a competition pilot is not even thinking about the beauty of the thing anymore. He's slamming that airplane around. He's forcing it to do what he wants it to do. Riding is a question of finding your way around an invisible geography. The sky, the land, the wind, uh, everything is attempting to give you information all the time. And the most important single thing is to open yourself up to, to what it's trying to tell you. To pass along by smooth and continuous movement, without effort or difficulty. To go unperceived, quietly or stealthily. To pass gently. To fly without motor power. To glide. Thank you.